Hi everyone, welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com. This is in continuation with the series on white blood cell neoplasms. In my earlier two sessions, we have discussed about how white blood cell neoplasms are classified. And in my previous session, I talked about the etiopathogenesis and the classification of acute myeloid leukemia. So in this session, let us learn morphological features of acute myeloid leukemia the clinical features of acute myeloid leukemia and the prognostic features or the prognosis of acute myeloid leukemia. So we know that acute myeloid leukemia is categorized into two broad categories, right? Acute myeloid leukemia with defining genetic abnormalities, acute myeloid leukemia defined by differentiation. Of course, the third category, a myeloid sarcoma is a separate independent category. Right? Now, how do you diagnose acute myeloid leukemia on peripheral smear examination or the bone marrow examination is by presence of increased number of myeloid blasts in the bone marrow. Okay? Now, what is the percentage of these myeloid blasts? It is more than 20%. Okay, remember, very important, it has to be more than 20% blasts in the blood peripheral smear or the bone marrow. Now, is this always 20%? No, the answer is not always 20%. If the leukemia is defined by the genetic abnormalities, then this cutoff is not useful. Even if the percentage is less than 20%, you still can confidently make a diagnosis of acute myeloid leukemia provided you have these genetic abnormalities documented are identified, right? So if it is by differentiation alone, if it is by the morphological features alone, yes, 20% is the cutoff. But if it is defined by genetic abnormalities, 20% is not the cutoff. Got this point? Now, myeloid blasts. Now, what do you mean by myeloid blasts? There are essentially different types of myeloid blasts, which you can appreciate morphologically. They are myeloblast, monoblast, megakaryotic or megakaryocytic blast or blasts with erythroid differentiation. These are the four different categories. The most common ones are the myeloblast and the monoblast. Now, what is a myeloblast? The myeloblast is a large cell with a delicate nuclear chromatin, 1 to 2 or 2 to 4 nucleoli, more voluminous cytoplasm as compared to lymphoblast. Shortly, we will discuss the differences between myeloblast and lymphoblast in more detail. As of now, remember, these are larger blasts as compared to that of the lymphoblast, which has more cytoplasm. And they also have very fine peroxidase positive azurophilic granules. Okay, And they also have ore rods, which are distinctive needle-like azurophilic granules, which can be found in many of these mylo myeloblasts. Okay, So myeloblast is a type of myeloid blast. The second important myeloid blast is the monoblast. These have large folded or lobulated nuclei. Remember, they have lobulated nuclei. They do not have or rods and they are non-specific esterase positive. Okay, This is one of the cytochemical strains which we do to identify monoblasts. Right? The third one is the megakaryocytic blast and the fourth one is the blast with erythroid differentiation. Now, what is the number of leukemic cells in the blood? Okay, It is very highly variable depending upon patient to patient, depending upon the type of leukemia, but usually it will be more than 1 lakh. But in around 50% of patients, the number of blast cells are less than 10,000 per cubic mm of blood. Okay very rarely or occasionally, you know, the blast can be entirely absent from the blood in the peripheral smear. You don't find any blast. Patients will have all the manifestations. But then if you do a bone marrow, you find the increased number of blast. When you don't find any blast in the peripheral smear, then you call it as a leukemic leukemia. Okay, that's another important Okay, and that is the reason why bone marrow examination is extremely important, absolutely necessary whenever you are encountering a patient of pancytopenia, right? Just because you have pancytopenia does not rule out leukemia and that's why bone marrow examination in the pancytopenia is, is important to rule out acute myeloid leukemia, particularly a leukemic leukemia, right? Now let us understand the differences between myeloblast and the lymphoblast. 
See, myeloid origin, as we all know, myeloid blasts are derived from the myeloid stem cells. Lymphoblasts are derived from lymphoid stem cells. Very simple. Myeloblasts, basically, they are the precursors of the myeloid lineage, whereas lymphoblasts are the precursors of the lymphoid lineage. Size, slightly. The myeloblast is slightly larger than the lymphoblast. It's around 15 to 20 micrometer in size, whereas lymphoblast is around 10 to 18 micrometer in size. Morphologically, see this is the illustration of the myeloid and the lymphoid blast, lymphoblast. Cytoplasm in myeloblast is more basophilic, it's more bluish, okay, granular. Very important to note that you have cytoplasmic granules in myeloblast which you lack in lymphoblast, okay. All rods may or may not be seen, most often they are seen in myeloblast. Whereas in lymphoblast, the cytoplasm is scanty, a granular, it can be bluish or gray cytoplasm. Okay, you can make out, see, look, this is the R rod. Okay, that's the R rod in the cytoplasm of the myeloblast. Lymphoblast, you have a very scanty blue gray cytoplasm, and the nucleus is round to oval in both of these. But remember, the chromatin pattern is different in myeloblast and lymphoblast. The chromatin is more open in myeloblast, whereas the chromatin is dense and clumped in lymphoblast and lastly the nucleoli they are prominent two to five prominent nucleoli in myeloblast whereas in lymphoblast the number of nucleoli are limited around one to two inconspicuous nucleoli okay so these are the differences between myeloblast and lymphoblast though we know the differences between myeloblast and lymphoblast okay this i am showing you the peripheral smear picture of acute myeloid leukemia particularly having increased number of myeloid all these are myeloblasts and this one you can also see there is a or rod in the cytoplasm okay so that is our peripheral smear if you have a classical myeloblast with or rods it's much easier but not all the times you can make a difference between myeloblast and lymphoblast and that is the reason you need to do special stains, cytochemical stains, okay. You can confirm AML by doing special stain or by doing flow cytometry. Firstly, the special stains, the myeloperoxidase is positive in myeloblast. Sudan black B is positive in myeloblast. No specific esterase stain is positive in myeloblast, whereas non-specific esterase stain is positive in monoblast right so um, we, we are discussing about the differences between myeloblast and the lymphoblast so myeloblast remember myeloperoxidase sudan black b and specific esterase stain whereas lymphoblast it stains per iodic acid stain it has a block positivity okay remember lymphoblast stains intensely positive with per iodic acid shift which is block for which is called as block positivity and that's how you differentiate myeloblast and lymphoblast sometimes it is difficult even in special stains then you will have to do a myeloid specific antigen assay in by means of flow cytometry okay okay let me show you this illustration of the flow cytometry this is showing cd34 positive intensely positive cd34 and cd33 positive okay the cd34 cd34 and CD33 are the stains for myeloblasts, okay. It is negative for CD64 and CD15 which are more, the markers of more differentiated cells. The immature cells are the CD34 and the CD33 positive ones, okay. That's how flow cytometry helps us in identifying whether we are dealing with the case of acute myeloid leukemia or not. Cytogenetic analysis, okay. Apart from that, we know that Acute myeloid leukemia is categorized. One is based on the genetic abnormalities, another based on the morphology alone, right? Now, we have to do cytogenetic abnormalities because once we know that there are certain abnormalities, the treatment is much simpler. We will know the prognosis of these patients, right? It is a central role in the classification of AML, which we all saw, okay? There are certain clues based on the clinical features as to what kind of cytogenetic abnormalities you can expect in these patients. For example, if this is a case of acute myeloid leukemia, which arises de novo, without any predisposing factors, without any myelodysplastic syndromes, you know, in the patient's history or in the young adults, 
I mean, you can expect these common cytologic, cytogenetic abnormalities like the translocations of 821, the inverse chromosome 16 and translocation of 15 and 17. And you know that translocations of 15, 17 is very important because it is a good prognostic you know, translocation. If the patient is on exposure, if the AML is seen after the exposure to the most DNA damaging agents, okay, then you can expect monosomy 5 and 7 sorry that is 7 monosomy 5 and monosomy 7 and you can also expect tp53 mutation in these cases particularly in cases where the patients are exposed to dna damaging agents an exception to that rule is when the patient is exposed to topoisomerase 2 inhibitors treatment Okay. If the AML, if acute myeloid leukemia is developed after the exposure of topoisomerase 2 inhibitor, then you can expect this KTM2A gene translocations. You know that KTM2A gene translocation has got the worst prognosis. Right? So, that is why based on the clinical features, based on the history of this particular patient, based on the drug history, based on whether he had MDS or not, okay, you can sort of guess what kind of mutations you will be expecting in these patients and that you know is very important because classification of acute myeloid leukemia based on the cytogenic abnormalities is very important because it helps in treatment, it helps, it helps in prognostication of these particular patients. How do patients of acute myeloid leukemia present to you? Clinical features, the chief complaints as I told you earlier itself that it is because of anemia, because of neutropenia and because of thrombocytopenia. Most often they present with you know, non-specific onset of fatigue, the patient can have fever because of neutropenia because they are predisposed to infections and spontaneous mucosal and cutaneous bleeding and that is because of thrombocytopenia. Right? Now, the cutaneous petechiae and echimosis can be seen, serosal hemorrhages can be seen, where all you find serosal hemorrhages, they can be find, found in the linings of the body cavities and viscera, whereas mucosal hemorrhages can be found on the gingiva and the urinary tract. These are the most common sites of mucosal hemorrhages, the gum bleeding, the urinary tract bleeding, they can be part of mucosal hemorrhages. Okay? Infections because of neutropenia, because the body is not having any mechanism to fight because of severe neutropenia, they are more prone for infections. Very frequently, these patients are you know, prone for infections and the sites of infections are the oral cavity, the skin, the lungs, the kidneys, urinary bladder, all on, almost all organs are involved here. Opportunistic infections are more common, you know. The organisms are normally there as commensals in you and me, but then in these patients, because of neutropenia, they flare up and then cause opportunistic infections like the fungi, the pseudomonas and even the normal commensal organisms can be dangerous or detrimental to these patients. Okay? As I told you, the third category of uh, AML classification, the myeloid sarcoma, it is basically a localized soft tissue mass, it is as simple as that, but it, though even though it is localized at one point of time, this can progress to a generalized or systemic manifestation in the form of acute myeloid leukemia. Okay? Prognosis. Lastly, let us talk about prognosis. All said and done, even though we have lots of leukemias, even though we have you know, advances in classification, AML, remember it is difficult to treat. Okay, it is difficult to treat. 60% of the patients achieve complete remission with chemotherapy. 15 to 30, only 15 to 30% remain disease free after the five after five years. But one good news about acute myeloid leukemia is if the patient is having this translocation. We saw that PML RAR fusion, right? Translocation 15 and 17, they have the best prognosis because it is curable. In 90% of the patients, these leukemias are curable, okay? And if the patient is more than 60 years, if the patient is having leukemia after myelodysplastic or post myelodysplasia, if the patient is having leukemia post genotoxic or the DNA damaging drugs, then they are the ones which have the worst prognosis. So that is all about acute myeloid leukemia. We discussed in the last 15 minutes about the morphology, the clinical features and the prognosis. With this, the first three parts, if you have heard these first three series of white blood cell neoplasms, I think you are good to go to understand the concepts of acute myeloid leukemia. In my next session, I will come out with some more white blood cell neoplasms 
Thank you for watching. Do not forget to like if you have liked this video. Do comment if you have anything to ask. Any topic you want me to cover, please do comment in the description, in the comment section below. I will try to cover those topics and do not forget to subscribe if you find this video useful and do share with your friends. Thank you. Bye-bye.